The Unshackled Waves, episode 159. Broadcasting from Melbourne, Australia, this is The Unshackled Waves with Tim Wills. Brought to you by theunshackled.net. Hello everyone, great to have your company. It was a week dominated by the culture wars yet again. The Australian National University rejected an offer from the Ramsey Centre for Western Civilization to offer a Bachelor of Western Civilization course, which would have offered some balance to the left-wing culture on university campuses. The New South Wales government announced new hate speech laws against those who incite or threaten violence against people based on a range of attributes under the threat of jail or large fines. Miss America, the world's most famous beauty pageant, is ditching its swimsuit section to focus on inner beauty in what is seen as another attempt to pander to feminists in the Me Too era. At the AFL's Gay Pride match, they decided to make some of the bathrooms all gender ones, which most people thought was ridiculous, but the rollout of these gender-neutral facilities continues. To look at these issues, I'm joined once again by The Unshackled's political editor, Michael Smythe. Michael, welcome again. Thank you, Tim. Now, the political week was bizarrely dominated by a university course because the Australian National University was in negotiations with the Ramsey Centre for Western Civilization uh, to offer a Bachelor of Western Civilization uh, course. Now, uh, the Ramsey Centre, it aims to establish uh, scholarship funds and educational courses in partnerships with universities that was set, uh, set up uh, by an endowment by the late uh, Paul Ramsey AO. Now negotiations had been going on for six months but after a uh, backlash from the, the academic union and student association, ANU uh, rejected uh, the course, uh, saying it would uh, compromise their autonomy and academic freedom. Now, this is denied by the centre's uh, CEO, Simon Haynes, and chairman, former Prime Minister uh, John Howard. But it's, it's such a coincidence that uh, as soon as there was uh, a, a backlash from uh, the, the academics and the, and the students, and you said, oh, no, oh, it, it, it doesn't fit uh, what we want in a course. Well, that's the sad reality, Tim, is that universities these days are less about academics and fostering the learning of students and more about money and kowtowing to social agendas that are, in many cases, in complete opposition to academic and intellectual development. The Australian, the, the Australian National Union, Union of Students, or the ANUS, as they are sometimes referred to, they were one of the main protesters against the um, inclusion of the Western Civilization course in the um, yeah, they subjects said it was that racist. could be taken. They said it was racist. They said it was racist. You're talking about Western civilization. Western civilization has so many races involved with it. Yeah, you get. I mean, not not every Westerner is British. Not every Westerner is French. Not every Westerner is German or Italian or Dutch or Belgium, Spanish, Portuguese, whatever. You know, I can keep. I can go on and on and on. There are what twenty odd nations in Europe. There's several more ethnicities, and that's the cradle of Western civilization. And you're saying it's racist. Yeah, I have a bridge to sell them if they believe that. Uh, it's it's amazing that, uh, oh, because uh, we've talked about on this show before, universities these days are dominated by uh, Marxist a academics and students developing all sorts of of uh, crazy uh, ideas. Uh, the most famous, of course, is the nappy change consent lady. But uh, one uh, one course, which we have to remember, would be a, a voluntary course. I mean, students would students would choose uh, to take it. That was uh, too much for them. Now, the vice chancellor of ANU went on 7:30 saying that uh, uh, it would have uh, compromised uh, too much of our uh, uh, academic independence. They uh, the, the centre demanded uh, more control over uh, staffing arrangements and curriculum than any other centre that we've ever had at the at the university. But that's just nonsense. I mean, it, it's ridiculous. Okay, 
yesterday, I I was telling you yesterday about an article that I had found uh, written in The Australian in regards to this. It was written by Mark Powell, who's the associate pastor of the Cornerstone Presbyterian Church in Strathfield in New South Wales. And he actually wrote, sorry, I beg your pardon, it wasn't actually the Australian he wrote it for. I read it um, from one of my sources who usually sources his information from the Australian, but this was actually from the spectator that he wrote it in. And what he pointed out was that everyone's, especially Peter Van Onselen, was blaming Tony Abbott for getting the course scrapped, even though the Ramsey Centre board actually had Kim Beasley on its board and as well as John Howard until Kim Beasley had to resign to take up his position as governor of Western Australia. So it's not like it was it's not like it was some far right conspiracy to try and turn Canberra students into a bunch of racists. And, you know, my my straw my somewhat ironic straw manning of the lefties aside, what was Abbott's actual crime? It was to according to Mark Powell, it was to have the temerity to argue that there should be guidelines as to how the twenty five million per year from the Ramsey spends this uh, sorry, Ramsey estate should be spent. But Jared Henderson made a point in his own article that conservative money and values are unsafe in liberal academic hands. So, you know, if you, if, for example, if, if we were as a country to give aid to a third world country, shouldn't we be saying to them, this is what you should be spending it on? Well, I mean, that's what you'd expect them to do. You know, you've got, you fulfilling a certain mandate, a certain responsibility. You spend the money, or you should spend the money in the way that it is directed to do. So Abbott had a point to say that there needs to be some earmarking, as it were, of the $25 million per year coming from the Ramsey estate. Everyone was uh, outraged that uh, such a course would be established, but yet there's, there, there was hardly any outcry uh, when the Australia-China Research Institute at the University of Technology uh, Sydney was set up uh, from uh, Chinese businessman uh, Hung Zengamo, who gave it uh, 1.8 million, and of course he's had links with the, the, the Chinese government, and it's headed by former New South Wales Premier Bob Carr, who's been um, parroting uh, Beijing uh, talking points, assisting Christina Keneally, and there's uh, all types of other uh, Chinese centres popping up at university campuses. So, uh, centres that are funded by or have links to a foreign power, oh, well, that's perfectly fine, but what about Western civilization? about us, Australia? Oh, we can't have that. Exactly. God forbid, Tim. I was going to make some smart aleck comment about Bob, uh, Bob Carr definitely needs to help Christina Keneally because she needs all the help she can get. But the other thing I was going to point out in relation to that, what did you call it, that place at UTS that they had? The Australia-China Research Institute. Thank you. The Australia-China Research Institute is just one example of foreign governments, foreign powers and foreign interests investing money, flooding, flooding our money with into universities. And one of the other big cases was Griffith University has an Islamic an Islamic Studies Center funded with millions of dollars. It was about $3 million from uh, Saudi Arabia. And it was a, and no one raised even a, a disgruntled murmur about it at the time, because, you know, it was like, oh yeah, let's build consensus. And you know, it's fine build consensus if you want, but don't then turn around and say, no, we're not going to have this course on Western civilization because it's going to be sexist, racist, imperialistic, blah, 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 whatever, you know, catch word or catch phrase you want to use to put down someone who is not as left as you. That's not the first time that such a, or what you'd term conservative, uh, Centre or Institute has been knocked back by a university. Let's remember uh, Bjorn uh, Lomberg. He was uh, 
uh, given money by the, the Abbott government to uh, set up a climate consensus centre here in Australia, and every university he applied to rejected it. Mm. And Peter Reid recently got fired as well for questioning the narrative. And it, it happens a lot more than you'd think. I mean, you hear about it a lot more overseas than you do here, because you hear about Ian Hersiali being denied the right to speak at Berkeley, for example, uh, a few years ago. Uh, you hear and you hear about Milo also having uh, Milo Yiannopoulos also having a similar um, constraint. You hear about it a lot more overseas, but it does happen here a lot more than a lot of people realize. It's simply because it, it's it's not even news anymore. It just happens. There's this blatant censorship of um, there's this blatant censorship of any ideas that are not left wing or that are remotely right wing. So I mean, you look at people like um, Tony Abbott. I mean, Tony Abbott did perhaps make a little bit of a mistake in saying that he he probably did make a little bit of a mistake i will admit in saying that there should have been some guidelines but i understand why he did that the the real mistake however has to be the fact that he went on to claim that the center would have a say over curriculum design and academic appointments when giving money to universities, which infuriated, of course, it infuriated ANU and any university because, like, you're going you're going to decide how we get our money. It's like, well, it makes sense, but he shouldn't have said that. And I have this sneaky suspicion he might have been goaded into saying that. Yeah, which uh, is a the, the, big the media can't his. can't wait wait to blame Tony Abbott for a, a blunder. Oh yeah, well, was Mark Powell was writing the Spectator? He was writing, you know, Tony Abbott is blamed for nearly everything these days: high rates of suicide amongst youth, global warming, as well as the current abilities. I'm sorry, current prime minister's ability to lose more consecutive news polls than he ever did. So, you know, it's like blame Tony Abbott, blame Tony Abbott, blame Tony Abbott. If he was in 1930s Germany and Jewish, well, we all know how that go. That's basically what he is. He is the ultimate scapegoat for everyone on the left. Even people on the right hate him. And it's just, it's just this pathological hatred that uh, they have of Tony Abbott, which just, which is, it beggars belief, really. It now seems doubtful that we're going to see any type of uh, right-leaning or uh, positive uh, institute about Western civilization set up at an Australian university. Uh, probably the, the future to rescue higher education uh, from the left is of, uh, of colleges like Campion College, which have the, uh, they're a liberal arts college. They have uh, one of the, the highest rates of um students student satisfaction in the country mm. there's also another thing that i was going to point out before as well is that you've got to start teaching western civilization in schools not obviously to the same comprehensive standard that you would in the university but you've got to start talk, teaching it in schools i mean this might make me sound a little bit snobbish but i had uh, the benefit of a lot of having a very decent general education independently of the school curriculum so i can appreciate the the virtues and merits of western civilization but the thing is if you had those taught in um primary schools or even just secondary schools you would a you'd smash the left b you'd create greater satisfaction in life and greater productivity and there, there are so many benefits that you could actually garner from having uh western civilization teaser courses put through our regular school curriculum before going to university and the history is just so rich and i could go on but i won't i mean you know how much i love western civilization New hate speech laws are going to be introduced by the uh, New South Wales 
Berejiklian Liberal uh, government and they'll be supported by the Labor Party. Uh, these laws will state that anyone who incites or threatens violence against uh, people on the basis of race, religion, sexual orientation or HIV status face a three-year jail term and an $11,000 fine. And we were told that existing vilification laws are not good enough because they did not result in a single uh, pro a prosecution, uh, which is, which is uh, when you think about that, it's they, they, they want to pass a law because they want to arrest and convict people. That's quite concerning. It's also disingenuous, Tim, because even though the existing vilification laws have not technically resulted in any prosecutions or, convi or convictions, there have been plenty of people who have been dragged through the um, anti-discrimination tribunals and the, or sorry, anti-discrimination boards and the, um, and the civic and administrative tribunals. I think it's John Laws. Of, John Laws, Bernard Gaynor, who shouldn't even be, who isn't even eligible to be tried in New South Wales because he's not a, a citizen in New South Wales. He's actually in Queensland, but they don't care. They actually, the kangaroo court of the ADB just keeps on pushing him and pushing him anyway. And serial litigants like Gary Burns just keep on suing because that he knows that it's kangaroo court and they're going to keep on suing him as long as they can, even though the high court actually comprehensively said, no, they do not have the authority to or the jurisdiction to prosecute this case. And yet they just keep on going. So this is just the icing on a complete shit cake, Tim, pardon my language, because of the fact that these laws are just, you know, they're basically the final nail on the coffin for, for free speech in New South Wales. You know, I mean, you know, we're gonna have a Tommy Robinson style figures probably getting arrested in New South Wales soon at some point at the, at the rate things are going. Maybe I'm being a little hyperbolic, I grant you, but it's extremely concerning that these laws, which are on top of the current laws that already exist, are being introduced. Yeah, what's happened to the Liberal Party? I mean, five years ago, they were the champions of free speech, wanted to reform 18C, but the uh, Attorney General who's introducing these, Mark Speakman, said they, they will not go unpunished, uh, these uh, people who uh, incite or, or threaten violence. Now, uh, these um, laws were, were lobbied by a group called Keep New South Wales Safe Coalition, and their spokesperson, uh, Vic... Al, Al Def, he's um, head of the New South Wales Jewish Board of Deputies, uh, he seemed to indicate that these uh, new laws were a response to the anti-Putin anti resistance posters that have been popping up all around the, the nation, including New South Wales, uh, uh, de uh, depicting uh, what they'd like to do to uh, gays and Jews. They're f extreme posters and, and ri uh, ridiculous, but th that seems to be the sort of trigger that they've used because um, the people are demanding, oh, you know, whoever put these up must be uh, arrested. And now we've got, because uh, threatening violence, well, that's pretty straightforward, but incitement to violence, I mean, anything you could say uh, could, if it's interpreted by somebody as an incitement, you could fall afoul of the law. Exactly. You know, if I have, if I'm bantering with a, if I'm in New South Wales, I'm bantering with a Protestant friend of mine and he's calling me a papist and I'm calling him a heretic, usually with a lot more colorful words, for example. And then he says something that I really disagree with on both the personal and theological level. And then I say, I jokingly say, Hernando fetched the torches. That could actually be deemed as incitement to violence. And it's, it's, it's scary, you know, it's something that's in context is completely harmless. It's just bad. It's not hurting anyone. Certainly not the person that is being ironically said to, but some, you know, some snowflake can overhear and say, oh, he hurt my feelings. He said, get, he said, fetch the torches or some nonsense like that. And it's like, come on, really? I mean, the, the, the problem with the reason using Antipodean resistance posters against gays and Jews is a very clever um, is a very clever pretext for ramping up the power of the state against private citizens. Um, because 
let's be clear, those AR posters are pretty vile. Mm, yeah. I mean, even, even, even if you don't like gays or Jews, even if you don't, and I personally don't care either way. I mean, I have a Jewish aunt. I have gay friends. I don't care. Even if I didn't, those posters are still repugnant to me. I mean, I'm a, I prefer to think of myself as a gentleman rather than as some thug. So, you know, I get why the posters are so objectionable. I consider them somewhat objectionable to my aesthetics myself. But using it as a pretext to ramp up not only the power of the state, but to curtail freedom of speech, even in small groups. Tim, that's a huge concern, and I'm sure you and many other people would agree with me on that. Yeah, definitely. I mean, race, I mean, uh, everybody agrees that you shouldn't judge people on the basis of race, but religion and, and sexual orientation, does that mean you know, we're not allowed to be critical of Islam at all in, in New South Wales? And... Uh, a sexual orientation like what if there's you know a a further you know de a debate on uh, lgbt issues because l let's remember that this lobby they keep campaigning for new laws does this mean that if you oppose them you'll be dragged dragged before the courts well that's what some people would like to do the funniest thing is most of the lobbyists who are pushing for such things don't actually give a damn about the lgbti community at all they're just using it as a political crutch to wipe, to whittle down the last structures of a cohesive society, which is the the family. They've already destroyed, the, they've already destroyed the church. They already destroyed monarchy. Now they just want to destroy family as well. But the thing is, as you were pointing out, yeah, you know, I mean, in, look at Victoria already under the current laws in Victoria back in two thousand two, two thousand thirteen, um, two thousand three, sorry. Um, uh, pastors Daniel Scott and Danny Nalia of Catch the Fire Ministries were actually hauled before the Victorian Civil and Administrative Tribunal after a complaint from the Islamic Council of Victoria. One of the members of the board at the time was Walid Ali, funny enough, and yet they gave him the Voltaire Free Speech Award. I'm thinking to myself, Voltaire is <laughs> turning in his grave right now. But what the ICV did is they could they took some they took some white Australian people and who had recently converted to Islam sent them in as infiltrators to the seminar the seminars that they were running and they made a complaint to the ICV the ICV made a complaint to VCAT and VCAT dragged them through the courts uh, dragged them through the kangaroo court of VCAT for ages even though the uh, judge higgins admitted that they hadn't said anything that was technically incorrect they had quoted when they were taking quotes from the quran they were saying it word for word and they had not misrepresented anything in the quran but they ruled that that even though that was correct because of the way that the quran was written and they were quoting it, they could be done for hate speech and incitement of violence, defamation of religion. And so, you know, New South Wales is not Victoria yet, but it's getting there with these new laws, you know. And it's not just Islam that you get in trouble for criticising either. It's not just Judaism or Jews you get in trouble for criticising. It's anything that is not Christianity. You know, you can, you know, I see people mocking Christianity and Christ all the time, and I think to myself... I mean, will you not be allowed to make Scientology <laughs> jokes about e-meters? Oh, they already send letters to everyone. That's the, the punishments in the process. That's how they just send letters to everyone. <laughs> but yeah, you know, that's another, that's another cult that should be dealt with, but that's another conversation for another time. But the thing is, you just look at, um, you look at these laws and you think to yourself, I'm sorry, I thought we lived in a liberal democracy here. 
You forgot it's to ridiculous. mention the, uh, the trial of the, the Bendigo Three, the three Patriot activists, uh, Blair Cottrell, Chris Shortis, and Neil Erickson, who did mm. the Islamic beheading video in uh, Bendigo. They were, uh, f uh, it wasn't an Islamic uh, complainant that, that took them to court, it was the, uh, the state government, and that's been um, going on for, for years now. They're appealing uh, the, the finding of guilty. But yeah, this New South Wales law, it goes goes way further than um, uh, the Racial and Religious Tolerance Act we have in uh, Victoria, uh, given that it includes other attributes. And yeah, it's, uh, you know, has, it comes with a hefty jail uh, term as the maximum penalty. Mm. I didn't want to mention the Bendigo 3 because there are, a lot, there are a lot of people who probably have no sympathy for them, even though people should have sympathy for them. I mean, what they did was nothing really criminal at all. I mean, even if you want to use a technical definition of breach of the peace or public nuisance, as we were talking about with Tommy Robinson, that's using the letter of the law to repress the spirit of the law. But how many people in theatre companies do stuff like those three guys did? You know, how many, how many, how many, how many shootings, beheadings, um, fights do theatre companies stage? For the purposes of creativity and for the purposes of telling a story, you know, how many do that? You know, are you gonna are you gonna shut down th if you shut the the Bendigo Three down? Are you gonna shut down theatres as well? It might sound like I'm straw manning, but I'm actually being serious here. It's it's concerning when you say how people can express themselves in a liberal democratic society. The Miss America pageant, which is uh, arguably the, the most prestigious of all the beauty pageants in the world, they uh, announced this week that they're ditching the swimsuit uh, section of their uh, pageant and instead going to focus on inner beauty, how their contestants will uh, help achieve uh, social justice. Now, this is obviously influenced uh, by the, the Me Too uh, movement and uh, complaints by feminists that uh, it objectifies uh, women. Now, there is still the Miss USA con contest, which is strictly uh, a beauty pageant because Miss America has always judged um, its contestants by other criteria as well. Uh, Miss USA, that was owned by uh, Donald Trump for for, t for 20 years. So there, there, there's still that if you want a traditional uh, uh, beauty pageant. Now, conservatives I've seen are somewhat conflicted because they they, they don't like the objectification of, of young girls, but they see that this change in the, in the pageant is giving in further to political correctness and other totalitarian forces. That's exactly right, Tim. And see personally I, I i don't watch it so i don't have a, a vested interest i don't have a horse in this race but it's it's it, the whole point of having a beauty contest is it's about beauty the physical aspect it's yeah it's about beauty i mean yeah you've got inner beauty as well but you need to look at beauty holistically you need to look at the outer beauty the inner beauty and you also need to look at the cerebral beauty, as it were, the minds. I mean, like every time someone says, I want world peace. Oh, fuck off. You want world peace. No one cares. It's what everyone says every year. I'm sorry. I should swear like that. But it's like, come on. Get, have a real response. I mean, if, you know, I would have no problem with them ditching this. I would have, well, I don't care anyway. But if I did care, I wouldn't have any problem with them ditching the swimsuit if they were able to, you know, probe the mind for something more constructive and helpful than, oh, I want my peace. <laughs> well, do you really think uh, asking them about social justice is much better? It's not. It's not. And that's why if I did care, I would be objecting to it because social justice, everyone's got an opinion on the world on, on social justice. You know, opinions are like armpits. Everyone's got them. And the thing is, I mean, why, what's wrong with women striving to be beautiful? I mean, you know, women 
it's not us men who make them do it, but women, you know, they love, you know, uh, making themselves up, uh, you know, choosing, you know, the, the right clothes, you know, why can't they do that if they choose? Remember, this is a voluntary contest and, you know, why can't, you know, the viewer at home enjoy it? They, you know, not in a sexual way, but just in a, a aesthetic way. Well, that's the thing. I mean, there's, all, there's, I mean, traditionally, M women have taken pride in their appearance. Men have also taken pride in their appearance, not so much these days. Case in point, my ugly face here. <laughs> but seriously though, it's there's nothing wrong with taking pride in one's appearance. People should take pride in one's appearance. It's just that people have fallen for this great lie of equality, saying, oh, we're all the same. At the end of the day, we're all, regardless of how we look, we're all the same with the logical implication of why should we bother making effort to look better? And it's a very, it's a very concerning thing when we've got people who are directing these contests saying, oh no, we're not, we're not going to do this part of the institution anymore because it's sexist it's objectifying blah 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 whatever reason they want to cite because you've you've just gutted the you've gutted one of the highlights of the of the whole show it's just yeah why? it'll be interesting to say uh, uh the next pageant um what the what the rating is like I thought you were going to say if it, was, if it was going to be full of angry feminists for a second there. Yeah, oh, well, well, that, well, that's another thing. I mean, you know, will they completely do away with the, the, the beauty standards where we see the, you know, the, the types of women we see at the, the, the slut work, for example? Will it be open to um, all self-identifying uh, women? Mm. The mind boggles. Now let's uh, turn to probably what we'd say is a um, another uh, absurdity, uh, which is well the AFL that they've had for a few years now a a gay pride game between uh, the St Kilda Football Club and Sydney uh, Football Club. This year it was at uh, Eddie Had Stadium, which I thought was uh, <laughs> ironic given that mm -hmm. Eddie Had's yeah. a Middle Eastern <laughs> airline uh, based in the UAE, which is under Sharia law, which you know they. They execute Which uh, kills gays. gays. Yeah, yeah. Yes, yeah. So, that, so that was, um, yeah, uh, uh, quite ironic. Uh, now I've always wondered, like, why does the the AFL do this? I mean, they have no gay male players. Like, even though the AFL has like basically been praying for one for years, and of course, during the marriage law postal survey last year, they had a, a they uh, got got the AFL sign signed down and put a yes. Uh, si uh, sign up uh, to, to virtue signal uh, there. Uh, virtue signaling, virtue signaling, virtue signaling. I, I, I don't know. I don't know. And frankly, I don't care who's in charge of the AFL at the moment. I was going to say Eddie McGuire, but that's uh, Gillian just McLaughlin is the current CEO, but he took over from Andrew Demetrio, who oversaw all this um, social justice stuff at the AFL. I mean, they. Uh, they they had the women's round uh, for a while. They also had a green round. Don't forget, there's indigenous round, uh, multicultural uh, round. I mean, there, there, there's there's everything all for all the identity groups. I don't have anything problem with any of the other rounds except for the multicultural round because you know civic nationalism and all. I have no problem with an indigenous round or a um, or even the women's round. Actually, the women's round is actually kind of cool you get to see Carlton and Collingwood sledging each other even more than you normally do. <laughs> but, <clears throat> sorry, but seriously though, um, it's it's all about virtue signaling. They're, they're just doing it because they want to be hip and cool and seem like they're not a bunch of thugs. They're worried that their players are going to look like a bunch of barbarians They and they want to try and refine their image. That's what it could be or it could be the fact that they're a bunch of lefties and they've finally taken over the afl as an institution i don't know for sure it could be either or it could be both 
Well, the big talking point uh, from the game was that uh, uh, the, uh, around uh, Etihad Stadium, there were in six locations, there were all uh, gender restrooms which said that uh, anyone can use these um, uh, regardless of gender identity and expression. Now, many were worried about the, the safety of women, and I, I think there would have been people uneasy at, uh, at, at the ground using these restrooms, like turning a woman's bathroom into a all uh, gender restroom. I mean, I don't think any, you know, sa uh, sane man would, um, you know, like feel right about, you know, even if it was called, you know, all gender bathroom for the night going into what is normally the, the, the ladies uh, room, because uh, let's remember, um, gender, uh, gender expression. I mean, that's just how you, how you feel. And so any, any person throughout the night could have said, I feel like this gender and use uh, the bathroom. Mm, exactly and it does i have to choose my words really carefully here because i don't want us getting sued but questions do have to be raised about um the safety of patrons if certain predatory people do take advantage of the accommodation and tolerance being utilized at um, Etihad Stadium. And the, and the thing that also uh, gets me is, um, are there, were there that many gender confused people at the ground? I mean, most transgender people, they just use the restroom of the, the gender they are and transitioning to. I mean, it's often pointed out, if you don't know which bathroom to, to use, Mm. Is so, sorry, remind me, is Etihad, is Etihad Stadium in Sydney or in Melbourne? Melbourne. And you asked me how many gender confused people there are? Yeah. <laughs> genuinely, Sorry, uh, ge genuinely one. Not, <laughs> one. Uh, uh, not, not people who identify as an attack helicopter just on a whim. Yeah. <laughs> they want to, uh, you know, be, be, be special and, you know, uh, want everything to revolve around them. Mm -hmm. Just basic narcissism then. Um,. Yeah, I, look, it, it's Victor. Look, I, I did make a snarky comment about Victorian Victorians, but in all seriousness, though, with the advocation of sorry, with the advocacy of state schools, of state, safe schools in state schools, um, there will probably be more people coming out and saying, "Oh, we're confused," so they're laying the groundwork for the future as it were yeah uh, of course um well, it was the st kilda uh home game so they said oh are the the all gender restrooms worked well there were no uh, reported uh incidents but it did provoke a, a firestorm on on social media it was reported in all the uh, the, uh, the papers the next day i mean these gender neutral bathrooms they appear to be coming more widespread where without much consultation it seems they get you know one complaint from some special snowflake then all of a sudden we've got uh, there these all gender bathrooms popping up everywhere mm. yeah people just but that's the thing and we were talking about it before we were talking about you know further vilification and hate speech laws uh, people are scared of getting sued these days they see people getting sued for a comment that somebody else made on their Facebook page, for example, and the person who owns said Facebook page, because they didn't moderate it in time or couldn't moderate it in time, gets, you know, even on a public post, gets in trouble for it, they get sued for that. So they don't want to get sued. That's why it's popping up without consultation, it's because people are scared of getting sued. Remember, Tim, the, the process is the punishment. That's what it comes down to. And of course, even after the controversy this week and the um, the Melbourne Cricket Ground, which is the other AFL venue in Melbourne, they said, hey, we're, uh, we're thinking of uh, introducing some as well. Hmm. I, I'm actually surprised MCG, the MCG didn't do it before Etihad Stadium. I mean, you know, can you imagine what the, what the, what the, I don't know if it's 
the Dubai the well, the, well, Dubai the, the stadium the stadium is the... owned by the the AFL now, so um, oh, you know okay. it's got the Eddie had name, so mm. <laughs> but but the, uh, yeah, the the, uh, the AFL's got a hundred percent ownership over it. Well, it's going to be called um, Marvel Stadium. They've just <laughs> struck a new sp- a sponsorship deal with uh, Disney, so. Oh, so not DC State. That's a, that's a shame. <laughs> but, um, yeah, it's... I, I don't know. It just seems weird. I mean, the irony is very strong here. So, Marvel Stadium? Really? really? Yeah. Eh, could do worse. Mm. Well, we'll see where this uh, phenomena goes. But, uh, as always, it's it's been a... Another uh, big week for for us culture warriors. We we haven't had uh, a victory, um, but yeah, we'll, we'll we'll obviously keep an eye on everything. And yeah, let's hope we have a victory soon. But thanks for uh, dissecting it all with me again, Michael. It's my pleasure, Tim. All right, everybody, that's the show for today. A reminder that tickets are on sale now for the tour by Stefan Molyneux and Lauren Southern in Australia this July. They'll be visiting Sydney, Melbourne, Adelaide, Perth and Brisbane, as well as Auckland. The tour is being hosted by new events company Axomatic Events. Please make sure to grab your place before they sell out by visiting axomatic.events. Lauren and Stefan promise to make a big impact to our national discussion while they're here, and we at The Unshackled are certainly looking forward to it. Axomatic is launching with a bang. If you're in Brisbane, you can meet the famous Mama Warrior against unsafe schools, political posting mama, aka Mareika Rancy, in person. She'll be appearing at the Mount Gravitz Bowls Club at 7pm on Thursday, the 21st of June. Tickets can be purchased at axomatic.events slash political posting mama. The Justice for Jalal campaign continues this Friday 15th of June at 9.30am at the Sunshine Magistrates Court where Ayu Deng, the woman who hit and killed 13-year-old Jalal Yazin Naja while he was skateboarding to school and received only 18, 80 hours community service is back in court again, charged with another offence. The Justice for Jalal campaign will be there to remind her of her crime and which she has still not expressed any remorse for. The True Blue Cruise annual Aussie Pride Flag March is nearly upon us. It was one of the first events we covered out in the field in Melbourne last year, and we'll be back again there uh, this year to offer extensive coverage. The date is Sunday the 24th of June at 12pm and begins at the Royal Exhibition Building. This type of event probably matters more now than ever, given the persecution of nationalists we are seeing around the Western world, so please come along. Don't be deterred by the campaign against racism and fascism. We always counter-protest this event and have been trying to spread misinformation about it all around Melbourne. Also don't forget if you want to take the Unshackled even further and score some awesome rewards please consider becoming a patron at patreon.com slash the Unshackled. Don't forget we have our online store Upright Market where you can purchase Unshackled merchandise and other gear for right thinking people. So thanks once again for your company and we'll see you next time. Thanks for tuning in to The Unshackled Waves. Please visit theunshackledwaves.net for all the ways to subscribe and follow the show. Don't forget to pick up your free ebook at theunshackledbattlefield.net and keep checking out theunshackled.net for all the latest news and commentary.